בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back here doing our Ikveta de Meshicha series based on the Kuntres by Arab Elchanan Wasserman, Allah Vashalom. Tonight's shiur will be uh, for a refuah shlema for Sarah Bat Sausan, uh, also for um, Emma Bat Dvora, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, Esther Bat Zipora, Avigail Bat Surya, Itro Ben uh, Avraham, Talia Bat Sara, Michal Bat Yael, Orit Bat Ilana, Stefan Ben Katarina, and also for a Atzlacha uh, Rabba, for Marsha um, Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, David Ben Esriya, Ruven Chaim ben Pala Parel, Shmuel Yitzchak ben Pala Parel, Naftali Tzvi ben Pala Parel, and Rachel bat Pala Parel. Kedosh Buchu Yivarech Otam Bekol Mikol Kol, Chaim Aukim Shlemim, Elim Torah, Mitzvot, Gminut Chasadim, Nachat Ubracha, to them and to all of the wonderful supporters that uh, help us do all the amazing things that Mesiyat uh, Dishmaya we're doing. Um, so, uh, Baruch Hashem, our series continues. We're going into another section, a very, uh, very interesting uh, completion to this particular section, I could say. And Bezat Hashem, you'll judge for yourself after we finish uh, tonight's shiur. In the last several months, the the Rav Rav Wasserman bechokhmato uh, has been giving us practically a nevuah, practically a prophecy. Uh, that uh, although it was relevant for his generation, is uh, needless to say extremely relevant to our generation. So relevant, it's better than watching the news because there's no lies here. You know, many times you see the news misreporting, doing different things, and perhaps sometimes when there's enough uh, pressure and uh, perhaps even enough money on the line, they retract certain statements and say they misstated or they misspoke and let's move on to something else. But the point being is that you see that many times certain things are misspoken in the media, certain mistakes are made, certain assumptions are made. People generally tend to do that. They assume a lot of things. They say a lot of things that uh, without complete knowledge. But here, Rav Wasserman did not misspeak even a single word did not misquote even a single verse, did not mistake in any one of his statements in the Torah because what he's saying is 100% Da Torah that we received at Mount Sinai over 3,300 years ago. And the reality is, is just like the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, that although Am Yisrael had over 1.2 million prophets throughout the generations, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke to, and they spoke to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Only 55 are mentioned in our Tanakh. Only 55 are mentioned in our Tanakh. 48 are males and 7 females. And the point being is, is that the Gemara asks, how come Hashem only mentioned those 55 in the Torah? Why didn't He mention the prophecies of all 1.2 million prophets? And the answer, the Gemara says, is because Hashem only included statements in the Torah, meaning, which includes the entire 24 books of the Tanakh, that are relevant to every single generation for eternity. And we see today, Rabotai Karim, that every single one of the verses in the Torah, the more and more you study it, the more you see how applicable it is, not only to society today, not only to your personal community today, but even to you personally. 
And the more we study what the Chachamim say, the more we glue ourselves to their holiness, to their Kedusha, that they glued to the Torah itself, the more we see Dvar Hashem, the words of Hashem, the acts of Hashem, Hashem Himself, you see, in His creation. And Rav Wasserman glued himself to the Torah like no other, simply because he knew this to be the only emet that exists. And that's why, throughout this entire kuntris, it's no different than reading some of the work, some of the genius, some of the kedusha of the Rishonim, the Achronim, or anything else where you see that what they're saying is relevant 100%. And here, Rabotai, in the last several months that we've gone through this series, we've heard Rav Wasserman rebuke one week after another, one page after another, one verse after another, sounding no different than Jeremiah the prophet, sounding no different than Yechezkel the prophet, sounding no different than all of the prophets, because anyone who spent time Reading the Tanakh knows that there was no such thing as a prophet who did not rebuke the people. Every single prophet from the beginning until the end of the Torah rebuked the people so much so that some of the prophets, the entire prophecy they gave that's mentioned in the Tanakh is only rebuke. Whether it was the Navi, Jeremiah, The prophet Jeremiah, they rebuked the people for different things, whether it be immorality, promiscuity, uh, uh, immodesty, or Isaiah that uh, rebuked the people for Chilul Shabbat, for Chilul Hashem, for idolatry, or Nehemiah that uh, rebuked the people for working on Shabbat, doing business on Shabbat, or even Ovadia, Ovadia Navi, that, that was a convert and himself told us in Sefer Ovadia, the disaster that will happen to all of those idol worshippers from Edom, from Esav, from Amalek, what's going to happen to them at the end of days? And the point being, Rabotai, is that we are dumbfounded time and time again when people say that you should not teach Torah with fire and brimstone. You should not teach Torah with rebuke. You should not teach Torah with this type of mentality and ideology because that's not the way of the Torah. We're dumbfounded only because we know that, number one, what they're saying is falsehood. But aside from that, we're dumbfounded simply because we don't know where they get that from. There is no source in the Torah. There's no source in the Torah that says that you're not supposed to teach Torah with 100% emet, even if that emet hurts whether it be the Mishnah the Gemara the Tanakh itself all the prophets in it Moshe Rabbeinu Yeshua Benun David Melech, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself at Mount Sinai or even at Sefer Bereshit and Noach when he spoke to men openly where is it said such things or maybe later on in the Rishonim, the Rambam, the Ramban. No, you're not going to find it there. What about later on, uh, the Gaon Mivilna? You're not going to find it there. Not the Gaon Mivilna and not the Arizal, not the Zohar Kadosh that came many, many centuries before them, but much of their work studied the Zohar and gave us an elaboration and a clarity on what's in there. You're not going to find it in the Zohar or any of his followers, which also means you're not going to find it in Hasidut. Although many people would like for you to think that Hasidut teaches nice, pretty Torah. We love everybody. Everybody's a tzaddik. Everybody has a share of the world to come. That's not what Hasidut really teaches if you go into the sources. If you go into the essence of Hasidut, into the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, into the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, into the teachings of the Tanya from Chabad, into the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, or anyone that you want to mention that was a real Chacham. Because 
Yes, although they wrote many, many different types of books and writings and speeches and so on, and not every sentence that came out of their mouth was, in essence, a rebuke of fire and brimstone, but let that not be misconstrued to mean that they did not rebuke the people on a regular basis and with fire that makes our fire seem like a little lamp that you use just to make sure that the bathroom stays lit. When you hear the words of the Chachamim from the previous generations, you hear their words of emet, and you're dumbfounded, time and time again, trying to figure out where did the speakers of the current generation, where did the rabbis of the current generation that speak against fire and brimstone, that speak against Musar, that speak against schar ve'onish, reward and punishment, where do they get the audacity to say that you shouldn't speak that way? Where do they get it from? What source says such a thing? You're never going to find it because it doesn't exist. Because every single Chacham, whether it's a Chacham of today that's a real Chacham, or a Chacham of yesteryear, or a Chacham that's included as one of the Rishonim 800 years ago, or it's one of the major Hasidim, or it's one of the Baalei Tosfot. Some say there were over 2,000 members to the Baalei Tosfot. Or it was in the days of the Gemara, 15, 1,600 years ago. Mishnah maybe, Zohar, where are they all getting their information? They're all getting their information sourced from the Tanakh itself. Where although we only pass in Alakha from the five books of Moses, it has to have a source from the five books of Moses. That's a considered an Alakha de Oraita, a biblical mitzvah. We have countless learnings and teachings from the t- other 19 books of the Tanakh that we use as what's called an Asmachta. An asmachta is a Talmudic term to tell a person that there is support for what they're saying, but in order for it to be a psak halacha, according to that, uh, that's a biblical halacha, it has to have a source in the written Torah, the five books of Moses, or be from Moshe Sinai, something that we know from tradition came from Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai. But nonetheless, everyone that has written a book that's considered a real sefer in Judaism, all of their information has to have a direct connection, a direct connection to our Torah, to our prophets. And if all of those prophets, those 55 prophets that are mentioned in Tanakh, if every single one of them rebuked us, if every single one of them warned us if every single one of them told us of the disaster that will come to us Shem Ishmael, if we do not follow the words of Hashem if every one of them did it how can anyone say something that's contrary to say such awful stupid words such as oh that's relevant to their generation but not to ours according to the Chachamim whether it be the Rambam or every other Chacham, to say such a thing, the Gemara even says, is 100% heresy. That person has no share of the God of Israel. That person has no share of the world to come. That person cannot be counted in the Minyan. To say that the Torah is no longer relevant to our current generation, is 100% Kfirah, heresy. So, we have to know where do they get all of this? Rav Wasim and Allah Shalom will give us a little bit more enlightenment. Biblical enlightenment. Rabbinical enlightenment. Of what he saw during his day. From all of these religious nationalist type of thinkers who called themselves rabbis. These modern orthodox type mentality the T. Leumi type mentality, Zionistic type of mentality, I love everyone no matter what type of mentality. Now, of course, you're going to find this in every 
sect of Judaism, this type of mentality. He calls a religion nationalist in his day because that's in essence what's his name or its title in those days. But in today's world, the more you meet Jewish people, and Baruch Hashem, I've merited to meet tens of thousands of Jews throughout the last seven years from all over the world, from all Kilot in all four corners of the world. And they each have told me time and time again that what we're talking about is happening in their community. What we're talking about is happening in their shul. What we're talking about sometimes is happening even in their own household. And the reality is, Rabbi Karim, is that we see that this mentality is a mentality that's not just to be found by modern Orthodox or by Hasidut Chabad, Hasidut Breslev, Hasidut something else, traditional Litvish, Sephardic, Ashkenazi. No, you can find this heretical type of mentality everywhere. And I don't just mean in the Keilot, in the community, because of course, every community has a bad apple. It's just the reality of life, even the, even the Rambam writes it in Ilchot Shuvah. But the reality is, Rabotai, is that we're talking about the same thing that Rav Wasserman mentioned, where the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, the fish stinks from the top. He's talking about the leaders. The leaders everywhere across the board. Leaders in Chabad, leaders in Breslev, leaders in other Hasidutes, leaders in the Ashkenazi community, the Sephardi community, and all others are all involved in Torah, in mitzvot, in chesed, in doing all types of things. But that does not mean that they're all doing it for the right reason. Some, of course, are tzaddikim gdolim and are doing it for the right reasons and Baruch Hashem, helping the community, helping Klal Yisrael. But unfortunately, Rav Wasserman has said that during his time, no different than ours, there was an enormous amount of leaders, rabbis and politicians and other types of leaders that he called bad shepherds, evil shepherds. Shepherds that misguided the community. Shepherds that told the community things that are the opposite of what the Torah says. And he spent much and much blood, sweat, and tears in his kuntres telling us and warning us from those shepherds. Tonight he's going to tell us the outcome of these shepherds. What happens with these shepherds? So let's say they don't want to teach fire and brimstone, reward and punishment. They don't want to tell their community that if they continue sinning and driving on Shabbat and eating on uh, Chametz on Pesach and eating on Yom Kippur and making all types of immoral crimes with society, whether it's with the Jewish society or the Gentile society and where all types of financial crimes with society, one or the other, if they continue that, you know, they're going to get punished, but he doesn't want to tell them that because he figures that if he does, maybe it'll hurt the community's bottom line to build a bigger community and a bigger yeshiva. You know, so he does all calculations, so he doesn't want to tell people the truth. What happens with those people? Rav Wasserman says that when a person follows the way of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, he can never lose. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Rabotai, sometimes even the one that's portrayed as a rabbi or a leader of a community, even if that leader says that he loves the Jewish people, can actually be the biggest enemy of the Jewish people. Sometimes on a large scale, like a prime minister, sometimes on a smaller scale, like a local rabbi or some other type of member. And Rav Wasserman tells us that if a man thinks in his heart that in spite of the Torah's warning, a prohibited thing can bring a great advantage, we must tell him the advantage which you see the Torah already saw, and if the Torah is still prohibited, it's evident that a benefit is not going to come from it, but rather a great harm will result from it. This was last week. 
where these different types of rabbis and leaders of his generation were in essence trying to do kiruv, but in a forbidden fashion. In essence, letting people know, listen, come to our Shabbaton. Yeah, but you know, Rabbi, I'm coming, I'm going to eat, but then I'm driving home on Shabbat. No, just come anyway, come anyway. One week, two weeks, three months, four months, the guy's driving on Shabbat for five years straight and the Rabbi doesn't say a single word. And you ask him, Rabbi, why don't you tell this guy to stop driving on Shabbat, move to the community or stay at somebody's house, but bottom line is stop violating Shabbat. He's not obligated to come to shul, but he's obligated to keep Shabbat. No, 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 we're doing kiruv. We're doing kiruv. You don't know what kind of kiruv we're doing. We're doing kiruv. Rav Wasserman says your kiruv is a mistake. Your kiruv is going to bring tragedy to the people because the people that are driving on Shabbat, the people that are making all types of sins against the Torah are understanding your kiruv as a permission to violate the Torah whenever the Torah doesn't fit their lifestyle. And this is the type of teachings that was going on already at the time of Rav Wasserman. As we all already know, this teaching only grew since then. And many communities have puppets for leaders who simply say what the crowd wants them to say. Simply do what the crowd wants them to do. Make people believe as if they're all tzaddikim because they made a single mitzvah of tzedakah or put on on tefillin or whatever other mitzvah they pick for the week or for the month. Make people feel like they're perfectly fine and they don't need to cry on Yom Kippur or Tisha B'Av. They're perfectly fine. They have nothing to repent from. And if they die, surely they're going to heaven. This is a mass murder that's been happening for decades. And Rav Wasserman continues now talking about the strategy of Kiruv, the strategy of lovey dovey, care bear Kiruv, that you tell people to simply whatever they want to hear. You don't rebuke them, you don't tell them the truth. You don't tell them that they're sinners and that they have to do tshuva. You don't tell them that they are in illegal businesses because you're afraid that they may get offended and they may leave the kila. You don't tell them to get divorced from their from their wife because or husband because they're forbidden to each other for different reasons. You don't tell them to take their kids out of that school because that school is simply destroying their kid. You don't tell them anything. You hope that one day they're going to learn it on their own from somewhere else. But God forbid if that somewhere else tells them too much truth because they'll find out that you're the liar. You're the one that knew the truth also because you also read the Torah. And the Torah does not miss a spot, an opportunity to rebuke us and to tell us the dangers of violating the Torah. This week's parasha, parashat kitisa, is one of the 12 places where the Torah Kedoshat tell us the magnitude of violating Shabbat. Someone asked me recently, how do I know if my rabbi is real, my local rabbi is real? I told him, if you want a easy or a hard way, he said, give me both. He said, the easy way is ask him the question that was asked this clown Weinberger recently, and he actually made, had the audacity to make a video of it, where a young, innocent Jewish girl asked him, what happens if I don't keep any mitzvot? I don't keep Shabbat, I don't keep anything. Am I going to get punished? And this clown who pretends to be a chassid doing kiruv says we don't believe in punishment, there's no punishment. It's a cleaning process, but Hashem doesn't punish. He loves everyone. And all this heresy, 100% heresy, that removes him from Klal Yisrael, you are not allowed to count him in a minyan for what he said. And had the audacity to publicize. Why? Because that's what our Torah says. Our Torah says that there is a punishment for somebody like that. A very dear punishment. And not telling people the punishment simply tells them you don't have to change. You don't have to keep the Torah. Only keep it if it fits your lifestyle. Only keep it if you enjoy it. 
only keep it if it fits your ideology and your rationale. And this Rasha Merusha publicized his own opinion, not the Torah's opinion, because the Torah tells us what happened to people that violate Shabbat. Torah tells us what happens to people that violate Hashem's name. Torah tells us what happens to people that go against the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm from Southern California and I'm studying chemistry. I grew up secular, so my question is, what does it mean to be a bad Jew? Are people who are more observant better than people who are less observant? And is it possible to lose your Jewish identity specifically in the eyes of God and as it pertains to the afterlife? Thank you. Somehow, people get this idea that, oh, if you don't do this, you're bad. And bad people go to a bad place after this bad world. They go to a bad place, which is even worse than this world. And it's because of the bad publicity that God has that people give up. They give up being good. Everybody's good. Everybody is good. Ben kach or ben kach atem kriyim bonim. Whether you behave well or you misbehave, you're my child. That means that God believes in the essential. He created us. And therefore, more than you and I believe in God, God believes in the essential goodness of each and every one of us. That essential goodness not, might not emerge in the course of each person's lifetime, but eventually it's going to be revealed. If it's not in this life, the afterlife, again, the publicity of it being a place of punishment and torture. No, the people who are running the gas chambers, there's a place for those guys and those girls. There are women there too. There's a place for that, for that chevre, for those people. There's a place. But our, our misbehavior is nothing more than um, a misunderstanding. God doesn't look at any one of us as being bad. The same way that I don't look at my kids or grandchildren as being bad. I can see them as being uninformed, mistaken, and I'm going to, find, to try to find ways, sometimes it'll hurt, to find ways to help them encounter the good within themselves. Growing up hurts. Adolescence is the most painful time in life. So that might hurt. And maybe in the afterlife there's some spiritual pain in order to be able to bring that person who God loves to, the, to that truth of his love and that great potential that perhaps was not lived up to during the course of one's lifetime and maybe there'll be another chance to try it again. That's another discussion. And you know what? When someone asks the Rambam, how come the Torah doesn't give the written details of what happens in Geinom? The Rambam answered, after you read Parashat Kitavo, after you read Parashat Bechukotai, after you read Parashat Azinu, and several other places in the Torah where HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises real life punishments that will happen to people in this world, you don't need details of Gainom anymore. Why? That picture that he's given to you that will happen to the people that violate his Torah is enough. Is enough for you to fear him. Because surely, that's only a fraction of what real Genom is. So he left that teachings for the oral Torah. Surely it mentions in the Torah, in the written Torah, that Genom exists and the names of Genom. But the details of what happens there we learn from the oral Torah. And the Rambam says there's a reason for that. The reason is because the real world punishments that are mentioned in the parashot of the Torah are enough to scare any normal human being that reads those verses and understands what they say. When the Torah says that when Am Yisrael does not follow the Torah, Hashem will punish them with all types of diseases that the world has known and hasn't known. 
things that you've heard of and things you haven't heard of things that are still in the world today and things that perhaps you haven't heard of in a long time when the Torah says that you will starve Hashem Yishmo if you sin from starvation people know it wasn't too long ago it wasn't too long ago that there was massive starvation in different parts of the world and there still are starvation in the world today try not eating for three or four days you'll get a little sense of what starvation feels like talk to your grandparents that survived the Holocaust they'll tell you what starvation feels like Kadosh Baruch Hu says that's a promise that will happen to people that go against the Torah as a nation individuals may die even before that happens but nonetheless punishments in this world do exist Kadosh Baruch Hu mentions that starvation is not even the beginning but rather the starvation that has happened to our poor nation several times during the destruction of the Bet Mikdash, the first and the second one during several times throughout history including the Holocaust where the punishment of parents eating their own children actually came true the prophecy the warning the scary warning you could possibly imagine came true several times throughout history so the Rambam writes when a person understands that Hashem says in the Torah several times not once not twice and not thrice no multiple times in the five books of Moses as well as in the prophets that such things will happen such starvation will happen you don't need details of Gainom. why that's scary enough And anyone that learns a little bit of history knows that this happened this happened even 70 years ago in the Holocaust what kind of punishments horrible ones for what this week's parasha says for what here's multiple places where Akadosh Baruch Hu mentions what happens to Michalat Shabbat? Hashem says, chapter 31, verse number 12 and on, in this week's Parashat Kitisa. What happens if I don't keep Shabbat? Mr. Weinberger. What happens if I don't keep Shabbat? What happens? You told the little girl nothing happens. Many of you fake rabbis tell young people who are curious nothing happens Hashem loves you then explain this verse Hashem said to Moshe saying now you speak to the children of Israel saying however you must observe my Sabbaths not just one Shabbat a year because there's a program that started to encourage you to keep it the rest of the year but rather you have to keep all Shabbats no exceptions no smoking no driving no working no playing with your phone you have to keep the Shabbat it's not a suggestion but an obligation that's what Kadosh Baruch Hu is saying not me for it is a sign what does it mean a sign that's the deal take it or leave it like it or dislike it that's the deal it is signed between me and you for your generations meaning for eternity not just a generation without cars of Moshe Rabbeinu but every generation including today to know that I am Hashem your God who makes you holy Gemara Masechet Shabbat says what does it mean to know that I am Hashem your God what we don't know it says when someone violates Shabbat it's like they're running in the middle of the street screaming I don't believe in Hashem and I don't believe that he created the world in six days Meaning, if you're Mechalel Shabbat and you know that Shabbat exists, you, my friend, are screaming to God that you don't believe in Him. The day will come where you will also scream to God, 
please help me. Will God answer you when you didn't answer him? You have to ask yourself that question. You shall observe your Shabbat. You shall observe the Shabbat. For it is holy to you. Its desecrators shall be put, have death upon death. Mot yumat. What is mot yumat? Death upon death. How do we die twice? Now, although at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, at the time of Sanhedrin, someone had violated Shabbat, which you see actually in the Torah, there was a person by the name of Tzlovchad. Mahama Sechet Shabbat says his name was Tzlovchad. He violated Shabbat by gathering wood, not driving cars, not working, not making money. He gathered wood. Witnesses saw him, told him, you know you're violating Shabbat. You keep violating, death penalty. He continued. He heard the lecture. Rabbi said, now let to violate Shabbat. But he said, no, no, I'm going to listen to Weinberger. Now I'm going to listen to Manus Friedman. I'm going to listen to all the other clowns that tell me I can do whatever I want. There's no judgment. There's no jury. There's no nothing. Hashem understands me. And guess what happens? They brought him to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu asked the Kadosh Baruch Hu, what should I do with him? And Hashem said, kill him in the most awful death penalty that exists called skila stoning in front of everybody and let the witnesses who saw him violate shabbat be the first ones that hit him with the stones what is skila you look at gemara maseret sanedrin gives the details of skila they throw a person off a two-story building and if he doesn't die they roll over a boulder on top of him shemishmo and if he doesn't die after the boulder runs on top of him and he goes to the bottom of the hill there's a bunch of people down there waiting with rocks to kill him awful horrific death for what for driving on shabbat for working on shabbat for doing business on shabbat for smoking a cigarette on shabbat rabotai for doing things that torah said don't do it and you did it anyway that's the first mut. That's the first death. What's the upon death if I already got a Shemishmo? Such a death? The Gemara says, someone who violates Shabbat, en lo chelek le'olam abba, has no share of the world to come. Why? That's why it says, death upon death. Death in this world and death in the next world. What does death in the next world mean? Permanent gain home until the neshama is destroyed. How could anyone run away from such a truth with some cowardly explanation that no, there's no punishment. No, every Hashem loves everyone. Or worse yet, man is the leader of all the heretics of the generation. Or Prager, the absolute mumar kofer mean and apikos combined no it's hashem should apologize to this generation says manis or things can change according to prager all of these heretics apikosim their followers their lovers their supporters all of them will get the punishment of each and every single person that they misled not only will that person that was misled if he doesn't do tshuva get punished but they will get their punishment in addition to their own punishment that's the biggest chess that someone will do with you is by passing the shayla for you because he's the one that's undertaking the gehenim for himself now which he removes it from you and he takes it on why because you say hey the rabbi told me so I'm 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 caught to the top line, so it's the rabbi's fault. No share of the world to come means no ulamaba. For six days work may be done, and the seventh day is a day of complete rest. It is sacred to Hashem. Whoever does work on Shabbat day shall be put to death. If the Torah says multiple times inside a single paragraph that a michalel shabbat gets a death penalty 
from Moshe Rabbeinu. How dare you tell people that nothing happens, Hashem loves them anyway. How dare you mislead the people with such a falsehood. Where did you get it from? Where did you get it from? Even the Christians believe in some sort of reward and punishment. Although it's complete heresy, complete idolatry, but even the idolaters believe in a reward and punishment. In fact, every single religion on planet Earth has always believed in a reward and punishment. That's the point of the religion, to tell you if you follow, good. You don't follow punishment, severe one. Now, although the Torah is the only real document that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the world, and all of the religions and their gods are fake, the reality is, Rabotai, to say that reward and punishment does not exist or it's minimized in some way and you don't have to worry is contrary to logic, it's contrary to the truth, and it's antithetical to our Torah. But yet, people time and time again listen to this garbage in their local communities and online. Why? Why do they do this to themselves? We'll find out today from Rav Wasman and the Ramba that's been helping us. Day and night, Be'ezal Hashem. So now the strategy of these wicked people, these philosophers who call themselves rabbis and leaders, these politicians and businessmen who have happen to have a beard sometimes why do they do all of this because they want to do kiruv they want to bring people closer 20 years the guy's driving on shabbat 25 years he's married to a goya 10 years she has a boyfriend and three abortions on the way too but no one says a thing why because they're trying to do kiruv and are hoping that if they don't tell them the reward and punishment that eventually they'll see so much love that they'll say you know what this rabbi this torah loves me so much i'm just going to become more religious that's that's the idea that says it doesn't work i can does says it doesn't work but let's see instead of bringing the wicked back into the ways of righteousness of wasserman says the religion nationalist which again is not just the religion nationalist of that day but today regardless of whether they're orthodox reform conservative chabad litvish hasidish sephardic ashkenazi it doesn't make a difference you're going to find filth in every hole and you're going to find purity in every community you have to know enough to decipher one from the other These religious nationalists, these modern thinkers, philosophers, if you will, instead of doing the so-called kiruv that they say that they're doing by bringing the wicked back to righteousness, helping people do tshuva, Rav Wasserman says, they themselves have been turned into faithful disciples of the free thinkers those rabbis themselves and all of the others that came with them become disciples of the free thinkers the wicked people they went to the nightclub to go try to do kiru before you know it they started dancing with the girls too why that's the nature of the world you cannot go into impurity without being affected These free thinkers apply all of their energy and strength, both privately and publicly, against those who bear the standard of the Torah. They bridge the gap between the two camps of the religious and the irreligious. These types of philosophers, who today are very, very well, very well publicized, advertised, Hasidim sometimes, well-spoken rabbi sometimes, politician sometimes, prime minister sometimes. These types of people, Rabbi Karim, instead of helping the nation, they have joined the free thinkers. And they, in the name of their own thoughts, but they call that the Torah, 
They're bridging the gap between the religious and the irreligious. They want unity, love of Am Yisrael. Let's love everybody. Right? Religious, irreligious. Listen, if you hang out with enough of with each other, then uh, you'll affect each other. So Rav Wasserman says, what's really the outcome? He says they're bridging the gap between the religious and the irreligious. But generally speaking, on a bridge, one sees traffic to and fro. You see on a bridge, some people go here, some people go back. There's traffic in both directions. That's the normal function of a bridge, Rav Wasserman says. But the religious nationalist bridge, the philosopher bridge, the modern bridge, the heretical bridge, what does it have? This bridge are to be seen only those who pass over in one direction. None return. Meaning, you try to accommodate your community by not rebuking them. You try to tell your community that Hashem loves them no matter what. You try bringing the Torah down to them instead of bringing them up to the Torah, thinking that that's going to help those people get closer to the Torah since you're bringing it closer to them. Rav Wasserman says, not only did they not get closer to the Torah, not only did they not do tshuva, but worse yet, you yourself fell down and became one of them. You yourself as a rabbi that you may have started well, somebody that knows, a dear friend of mine, knew well, knew well a long time ago, Manus Friedman, for example. And he says to me, he told me, listen, 15, 20 years ago, he didn't speak like that. So what do you mean didn't speak like that? He said, I'm telling you, I know him for 30 years. 15, 20 years ago, he didn't speak like this. He was a normal yid. He said real things. He didn't say this apikosu that he says now. I said, why don't you talk to him? He says he doesn't listen to nobody. Doesn't listen to nobody. That's what happens when you don't have a love. Same thing about Dro Kasuto. Always a problematic person, but when he was closer to the yeshiva in the earlier stages, he didn't do as much damage as he does now. Same thing with a lot of others. What happens? They bring down the Torah in order to bring people close to it, but end up falling face first and become one of the people. This in itself is one of the rules of nature. Where do we learn this rule of nature? Of course, from the Torah. Rav Wasserman brings a verse where we learn this rule of nature. The prophet Haggai, Chapter 2, verse 11 and on. The prophet says, talks to the Kohanim in their day, in the name of Hashem. Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, inquire now, for ruling from the Kohanim, saying, if a person carries ritually defiled flesh in the corner of his garment, and then he touches bread with his garment corner, and the bread touches stew, and the stew touches wine, or oil, or any other food, does the food become defiled? Kwanim answered, no, no. A guy says, if one, a second question, in the name of God, if one touched a dead body, would touch all of these, would it become defiled? And the Kwanim answered and said, yes, it would become defiled. So far, two questions. The Malbim says, in these two questions, the Kwanim didn't get it, but Chagai was rebuking them in two different ways. With the third question, they'll understand that they just got rebuked three different ways. 
In essence, he's saying that if something is holy and it touches something else that's holy, something that's a part of the Kobanot and so on, in the Bit Mikdash, piece of meat, supposed to be a sacrifice, if it touches your shirt, does that make you holy? Does that make your shirt holy? The Kohanim say, no, absolutely not. No. Only if the oil goes inside the meat and so on, it becomes in essence part of it, does it actually affect it and become holy. But just a superficial touch, holy to something that's not holy, it does not make it holy. Doesn't make it holy. What is that like? You go to a lecture, you hear the Vrai Torah. Torah is 100% emet. Rav Wasserman himself is speaking to you. Do you automatically become holy? No. Why? 15 minutes after the lecture, you could be making another sin. It's possible. Does it help you? Does it give you information? Sure. How are you going to apply it to your life? That's obviously your choice. But just attending the lecture, reading the book, does that make you holy? No. You could go to learn Torah 18 hours straight. Say every word the right way. Understand every single verse. Leave. Leave that to after you've learned 18 hours straight. There's only 24 hours in a day. But before you left to go home, you decide to have a conversation with one of the congregates in the Keilah and say la shonara about a chacham. Say la shonara about another Jew. Follow him for an hour straight. All 18 hours of Kedusha, of toil, of Torah that you have invested go right to the sitra achra they don't even go to the garbage it goes to the satan himself it gives more power to the satan and you will get punished for every minute of it why that torah was a tool for you to use to become holy you chose to read it learn it ignore it as a result of your actions so just simply learning attending doing doesn't make a person holy just like a piece of meat that was going to be used for a sacrifice in the bit mikdash a holy piece if it touches something it's not going to make it holy you have to become one with it on the other hand if this piece was tame impure as a result of it touching a dead body a dead person Touch dead person. That's the Tum'ah of Tum'ah. Highest level of Tum'ah. Some say the Nida is even higher Tum'ah. But nonetheless, high level of Tum'ah, traditional Tum'ah of impurity. That meat touches something, a, a dead body. That's it. You can't fix it. It stays tame. It stays impure permanently. There's no way to fix it. No way to fix it. That dead body touches somebody else, also becomes tame. Touches you, you become to me. That piece of meat touches something else, it can also become to me. We see here that to become impure, to become spiritually filthy, if you will, very easy, much easier than becoming holy. That's in essence what Chagai Navi said to the Kohanim so far. And that's what Rav Wasserman is quoting. Then he goes with the third and final rebuke. Because so far the Kohanim got 10 points for each question. He asked them, do you get this right? You get 10 points. They got the first question right. He said, do you become pure as a result of uh, touching this holy piece? No. You're right, 10 points. Do you become impure? Do uh, uh, Do you become pure if you touch this or impure? They got it right. Okay, so what's the third question? A guy spoke up again and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, the word of Hashem, and so is all their handiwork. What they offer me, what they offer, they will be defiled. But consider the situation from this day and previously, before, before stone was placed upon stone in the sanctuary of Hashem. When they would come to a grain 
a grain heap of what would have been 20 units but was only 10. in so many words the prophet is telling them you know the answers you know pure and impure those laws of purity and impurity apply to you so long as you act pure you will be pure but it won't come easy you learn to lie it's not going to make you pure automatically you have to toil and you have to fulfill it you have to overcome the obstacles but if you hang out with impure people listen to impure people by default you become impure you listen to a five minute video from an apicoris automatically it affects your neshama that's why i tell many of my students to stop listening to these heretics looking for more heresy that they say why enough's enough you know he's a heretic you don't need to uh listen anymore enough's enough why it'll affect you in a negative way even if you mean well you need to have a lot of kedusha to compensate for the tuma that you hear from this heretic five minutes so Haggai rebuked the people saying you know the truth about purity that it's not easy to become pure you know the truth about impurity that it's actually easy to become impure but yet you do not apply it to yourself even though the whole thing is talking about you as a people you will either become pure or impure based on your surroundings based on your source of information based on your actions based on the words that come out of your mouth based on the things you allow the windows of your soul to see based on the thoughts you allow into the storage place of your neshama based on the feelings you allow your heart to feel that is what is going to turn you into pure and pure but you're not applying it because you figure no i learned in yeshiva already so 15 20 years old i know enough no habibi it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way Rabotai Karim. there's not a week that goes by and i don't get a mayday call from different people from jewish communities i had one time a person call me and tell me listen i grew up in a religious house my father was a rabbi i said good okay so what's the question why are you call me why don't you ask your rabbi why don't you ask your rabbi your father so i can't ask my father this question i said okay well you said this is a pikuach nefesh what's the pikuach nefesh he said well it's not really pikuach nefesh it's just that uh, uh, i heard one of your clips and you said that uh to have a uh you know have a relations with someone that's a uh, not jewish is uh not allowed i said yeah i think i just quoted the, the torah yeah of course what does that have to do with you you're you're, you're a religious girl grew up in a religious neighborhood your father's a rabbi yeah well i you know i know for some reason I, I skipped that lesson my boyfriend he uh he's from a different nation another woman calls me similar situation comes from a religious family some of our brothers are rabbis tells me listen uh, i don't know how to tell this to my family maybe you can but tell them that uh i'm pregnant i said oh Masalto. she goes well they're not gonna really agree with you i said well why not well i'm not married and on and on and on the stories go on and on and on the stories go Rabutai. I have young men call me from different kolels and yeshivot from all over the world thanking me thanking me for having countless shurim about tikkun abrit because they say listen I've been going to yeshiva to kolel to learn Torah to learn everything and me and every single one of the bachurim in this building have this problem and nobody's teaching us all of us get the information from your shurim whenever we can watch them please make more all of us have tikkun abrit issues all of us have become abrit issues all of us Shemishmo. this is words that they're saying rabotai not me the reality is rabotai is that 
just to be surrounded by Torah and rabbis and different books in itself is not going to be sufficient to make a person pure just like a piece of meat touching you will not make you pure you have to make it one with you but on the other hand hanging out with a few low lives hanging out with a few people that like to look where they're not allowed to look they like to inhale and ingest things they're not allowed to ingest they like to be in places they're not allowed to be they like to say things they're not allowed to say according to the torah of course and you hang out with them you listen to them you even use them as a figure you get your information from automatically you will get affected to the point of becoming tame instantly why that's the Torah that's the Torah and that's the danger of listening to apikosi that's the danger of listening to heretics it affects you immediately now Haggai the prophet answered the people and Rav Wasserman says these verses tell us that by mere contact with holiness we do not become holy but through contact with unclean things we become unclean immediately and the Torah testifies in Tehilim the first verse of Tehilim you open a book of Tehilim what do you see first verse all of us all of us see the same thing all of us see the same thing Torah says praiseworthy praiseworthy is the man that has not walked in the counsel of the wicked what's so special about this verse that David Melech makes it the first the first one that he mentions in his 150 Tehilim praise, praiseworthy is the person that has not walked with wicked people Rav Wasserman brings the Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara, page 18b Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi toiled in this verse he says what is the meaning of that which is written in Tehilim Asher Aish Asher Lo Alach Beitzat Reshaim Ubederech Hataim Lo Amad Ubemoshav Letzim Lo Yashav. What is the meaning of this verse? What is the meaning of praiseworthy is the man who did not walk in the counsel of the wicked and who stood not in the path of the sinful and sat not in the session of jesters given that he did not walk in the wicked where and what sinful path could he have stood and given that he did not stand among the sinful where and at what evil session could he have sat and given that he did not sit where could he have scuffed Bishimon explains rather the verse means to tell you that if one anyone merely walks upon a sinful path hangs out with wicked people his best friend is secular her best girlfriend is secular zionist off the derech she used to be a chasida but she's not anymore but she's my best friend his best friend is an idol worshiping Christian Catholic or some other Buddhist best friend a source of information on YouTube is some Buddhist monk or some other type of atheist a heretic what does that result in that's merely walking in a sinful path and if he walks in a sinful path eventually he will stand and linger there you press play on that YouTube you attend that lecture you contribute a few dollars to that organization you recommend the video 
even a good kosher one, while you know that there are many, or even a single one that's not kosher. Eventually, he will stand and linger there. Eventually, you'll subscribe. Eventually, you'll become one of the students. Yes, that's what it says. And once he stands on such a path, he will eventually sit and associate with scoffers. Eventually, your Hasidish friends that are tzaddikim will no longer interest you. Eventually, your chavruta, who's a tzaddik talmit chacham, learning daf yomi with you for five or ten years, will eventually annoy you to the point where I don't want to learn with him anymore. He's not philosophical-minded like I. He's not open-minded like I. Eventually, your classmates at yeshiva will no longer be your friends. Why? Ah, they're, uh, they're too religious fanatic for me. I need somebody a little bit more modern. By listening to the philosophers, the modern speakers, the heretics, the apikolsim, subscribing, supporting, sharing it, eventually you want new friends that are just like the new version of you. Eventually you want friends that are like the speaker, a heretic, an apikos, a lasha. That's what it means to sit. And if he sat, then eventually he himself will scuff. Once this person sits down and becomes friendly with more and more heretics, eventually he himself starts creating new forms of heresy, new forms of weapons against the Torah. And if he scoffs, then scripture says, if you have become wise, then the benefit gained in your becoming wise is your own. But if you have scuffed, then you alone will bear the consequences. This is a verse in Proverbs 9.12 by Shlomo Melech. A person that could have learned Torah for 20, 30 years. All of the wisdom they gained was for them. Became a rabbi of a community. Considered as himself and considered by others a Tamit Chacham. That was for yourself. You decided to go against Chachamim. You decided to go against Da Torah by changing it, distorting it, keeping quiet when not allowed to be quiet because there's Chilul Hashem, saying things that are false when you know they're false, misstating the truth because it doesn't suit you. That type of behavior takes all of the Torah that you've learned and gives it to the Sitra Acha, the other side, the Satan. All of what you've learned goes there. And you will suffer the consequences. That's just the beginning. The Gemara continues, Rabbi Elazar, Kol HaMitlotzet Yesurim Ba'im Alav, where scoffs affliction beset him. Shene'emar, the verse says, So now do not scoff lest your afflictions grow severe. Says the prophet Isaiah chapter 28 verse 22. Rava says to scholars, the students, please, I beg you, not to be jesters, not to have joking sessions in the yeshiva. Why? Because if you do, afflictions will beset you. Gavkatina says, whoever scoffs, his income diminishes. As the verse says, God withdrew his hand from the scoffers. And Resh Lakish says whoever scoffs will fall into genom 
זר יאיר לת שמו עושה בעברת זדון. זד יאיר לת שמו עושה בעברת זדון. The verse says, a willful arrogant man, a scuffer is his name, and he acts in the fury of willness, willfulness. Ven avra el genom, and fury is not but a designation for genom. Meaning anytime it mentions fury, that's in essence another teachings that is implying that this person will end up in genom. As the verse says, that day will be a day of fury. There's other teachings, other teachings, but worst of all is what Rabbi Hanilai says, whoever scuffs causes ruin to the world. So here we see Rabotai, to being a jokester, being someone who doesn't take the Torah seriously, loves everyone pretending that's a scuffer not just the one that makes fun it's not just the one that makes jokes but rather someone who starts off by hanging out or watching wicked people listening to wicked people then befriending them then becoming one of them and eventually becoming one of these scuffers and that reality Rabutai, is what happened to all of these free thinkers religion nationalist modern type thinkers in all generations our own included and of Wasserman says the Torah's testimony is everlasting and therefore it says if he walked he will stand in the way of sinners and if he stood he will surely sit in the seat of the scornful and this applies to all times and all conditions he who thinks himself an exception is a fool an arrogant spirit but he who hearkens to the advice of the Torah happy is his lot Rav Wasserman says if you think that you can listen to heretics be surrounded by atheists apikosim even if they have a beard and they call themselves a Hasid rabbi you think that you won't be affected in a negative way you're mistaken you're mistaken in such a way that Rav Wasen himself says in the name of a Torah you're such a mistake you're it's arrogance that's leading you to think such a way you think that you can go and pray and hang out and listen and talk to and uh attend the lectures and the uh, events and all of the different things of this are because and not get affected pure arrogance you're walking into a volcano and expecting not to get burned only an arrogant fool would think such a thing one of the chachamim of this generation especially in the topic of tikkun abrit rabbi yaakov ben hanan in the sefer when you go out to war brings many sources from different chachamim one of them he says in the name of rabbi nachman in breslev rabbi nachman in breslev allah wa shalom his comment in the uh, chapter 19 of shmot says that the creator of the world says that the way i will bring you close to be with me is through an eagle rabbi nachman breslev says that according to the secret part of the torah the eagle is the brit the brit of the jew but in this generation says rabbi yaakov in this generation of ours the final one there are so many people who fool the masses into accepting false ideologies and they cause them and the entire nation of Israel a tremendous harm that no that has no equal for they publicly present all types of lectures that are that there are in the Torah but the main aspect of Judaism which is keeping the Brit that the Jews perform at the age of eight days old 
they do not speak about they do not explain how important this through this they cause people to be extremely distant from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. and it's already known that the creator of the world testified for us what is the main thing for Hashem to come close to us and his divine presence to dwell among us as the verse states he will not see among you something immoral and turn away from behind you meaning the creator of the world tells us with simple words do you want to check if I'm with you escorting you and dwelling among you see how keeping the breed the covenant is with you and how the issue of sexual immorality is with you which is anything related to sins of forbidden relations and lack of holiness this is the main gauge says Akadosh Baruch Hu. and it's a shame that in this manner these teachers these leaders lead the masses to the delusion and the mistake that it's possible to be a servant of Hashem even without protecting your breed you see Rabotai Karim there are many people that can tell you nice stories about the tzaddikim of the previous generation and even the current one but that in itself is not going to make you a tzaddik if you don't do what those tzaddikim did in parashat kitavo Rabbi Yaakov ben Hanan says the Ariza in Shah Ali Kutim, page 323. He brings that there are 98 curses mentioned in this parasha, which cause every heart to tremble. And the Arizal says that when a man shoots a semen like an arrow as it says in the Gemara Masechet Nida when he shoots a semen like an arrow wastefully that semen does not go to the right place to the female that it's supposed to to his wife as the way of the world is supposed to be then Hashem Yishmol, that arrow comes back towards him to destroy his whole life Hashem Yishmol. And Arizal says we learn this secret teachings from the word arrow. In Hebrew is called chetz. Chetz is spelled chet tzadik. Chet is the value of eight. Tzadik is the value of 90. Total 98 as in the 98 curses. 98 separate curses of Parashat Kitavo. Saying in the name of the Arizal that someone that wastes seed is someone that violates the entire Torah and will get all 98 curses of Parashat Kitav Hashem Shmo. So when someone that calls himself a rabbi, a chassid, or even a simple religious Jew, tells you that there's no punishment, God loves you, tell okay, can you explain to me why the Arizal says I'm going to get 98 curses for what I did 15 minutes ago wasting seed and what I did yesterday wasting seed and what I'm planning on doing tomorrow wasting seed can you tell me how the Arizal dares tell me I'm going to get cursed for wasting seed but you're telling me that Hashem loves me no matter what can you explain to me that how come Hashem said in Parashat Kitisa this week how dare he tell me that he'll kill me if I violate Shabbat if you for the rab are saying he's not gonna do anything to me. I have uh, Hashem loves me anyway. How dare Hashem say that he's gonna kill me when you saying differently than Hashem? You obviously can tell Hashem what to do, right? You're a rabbi. You're what are you? Chasid Chabad? What are you? Breslev? What Chasid? Chasid Geinom? Which Chasidut are you? Where are you? Well, you can tell Hashem what to do, right? Rabbi Karim. There are tzaddikim in every community. And there is shayim in every community. The only way that you can know the difference is if you learn Torah, if you toil. If you learn Torah and you learn from tzaddikim, you learn from people that are trying to be tzaddikim, you learn from people that are trying to work on themselves. That's one of the secrets that we learned from different chachamim, included in our series that we have each Sunday, based on a sefer by the Chazonish, who says that the key 
to gaining emuna is by working on your character traits working on your character traits one of the things that we learned is that the key to running away from heresy is also working on your emuna but not the emuna part of just believing that hashem runs the world and he's going to help you but rather that hashem runs the world and he's watching every single little behavior that you're doing and if you modify the torah even a little bit hashem will be there to pay the reward or punishment you see many times people try to change the torah to fit their life and many times there are people that change the torah for them and they don't double check as Avgalinsky said in an analogy one time and he said that there was one guy that bought a very fancy hat that he wanted to use for a special occasion maybe a chatuna or a bar mitzvah or some type of an event and he bought this hat very special expensive hat and he didn't wear it for a while and eventually there was a very big event he said i'm gonna wear this fancy hat that i've been waiting for and he takes the hat puts on his head and realizes hat doesn't fit his head's too big he doesn't have much time he runs to the hat maker say hey i have an emergency i bought this hat from you some time ago but this hat brand new never wore it doesn't fit my head i need you to fix it how many take takes the hat he said well listen this kind of hat is one of a kind i don't have another hat like this but it's such a special hat you know what this is what we can do i got a machine over there machine i use for the hats instead of putting the hat let me put your head there squeeze it squeeze your head a little bit and then that way the hat's gonna fit you what do you think you ready the young man says to him if you wanted to kill me in a vicious way slowly maybe you could have picked something else but that's not something i'm gonna do he said, why not it's an expensive hat it's a good hat you know you're gonna lose on this hat he said listen you don't change your head to fit the hat you change the hat Rav Galinsky says the hat Rabotai Karim is all the junk in the world you don't allow the junk in the world to change the holy Torah you don't allow the junk in the world whether it's coming from people that have a beard or the ones that don't change the Torah Torah is the foundation of Am Yisrael the only way to change things is if we change ourselves and that's in essence one of the things that the Rambam helps us with and so does the prophet Isaiah and so does the rest of the Chachamim see the Rambam writes in Ilchot Deot chapter 2 the whole chapter is about this it's a wonderful chapter very quickly you could read it probably within not uh an hour or so half hour or so if you read it carefully maybe a few hours or a few days but nonetheless to get the point you can get it relatively quickly by just simply with the things that i'm saying in chapter 2 of Yilchot Deot, the rambam says the following he says says there are some people that are physically ill the sick where the bitter tastes sweet and the sweet tastes bitter to them and some of the sick even desire and crave that which is not even fit to eat such as dirt and charcoal and actually hate healthy foods such as bread or meat all depending on how serious the sickness meaning somebody can get sick shemishmo with this coronavirus you lose your sense of uh, taste of smell sometimes and you don't even know what you're eating it all tastes the same like the snake it's a punishment of its own so 
The Rambam says, yeah, some people get sick and they food tastes to them the opposite of what it is. But some people are even sicker when they start wanting to eat dirt. They start wanting to eat things that are bad for them and not good food. It's all based on how sick a person is. Similarly, he says, those who are morally sick, those who are morally ill, desire and love bad traits and hate the good path and are lazy to follow it. Depending on how sick they are, they find it exceedingly burdensome. The more difficult you find the good path of the Torah, the more morally sick you are. In the beginning, keeping Shabbat seems like a burden of a mountain. In the beginning, protecting your brit seems like you'll have to change the world. In the beginning, being Shomer Nagia and being honest in business seems like an impossibility. As if God's picking on you. Why me, you say? The truth is, you only think that and feel that because you are sick. Spiritually, morally sick. And the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call the bad good and the good bad, who take darkness to light and light to darkness, to be darkness, who take bitter to be sweet and sweet to be bitter. Concerning them, the Rambam writes in Proverbs 2.13, those who leave the upright path to walk in the ways of darkness, says that the Torah already mentions these people. Prophet Isaiah, Proverbs, these people, everything is the opposite. Sweet is bitter, darkness is light, light is darkness. Everything is the opposite to these people. What does it mean the opposite? It's wicked people is what Isaiah is referring to. So what is the remedy for the morally ill, the Rambam asks? and answers they should go to the chachamim to the wise among am israel as they are the healers of the soul and they will heal them by teaching them how to acquire proper traits until they return them to the good path you want to heal your awful desires to do bad things you want to no longer desire to be immoral you want to no longer waste seed you want to no longer detest mitzvot such as shabbat and wearing a tzitzit you want to no longer be a terrible husband or wife you want to no longer decide your clothing based on how much attention it's going to get you because you need to be the center of attention you want to no longer desire to teach falsehood you want to no longer desire to befriend only people for their money and their possessions of of other things of power you want to no longer be connected to wicked people if you want you can get how go to the chachamim that teach musa go to the chachamim that will teach you how to acquire proper traits because they will teach you how to do it until you've done complete tshuva concerning those the rambam says who recognize their own bad traits and do not go to the wise they don't go to the chachamim she knows that she is immoral she knows that she is immodest she knows that she is an adulterer he knows he is a thief he knows he is a mechalel shabbat and a liar he knows all of these things but yet he doesn't want to learn musa why ah no come on i don't feel like having this rabbi yell at me anymore i'll just i have my own beliefs 
I have my own way of connecting to God. I'm going to find a way maybe later on when I get older. The Rambam says, for those people, we also have a verse. In the name of Shlomo HaMelech, Proverbs 1, verse 7. Fools scorned wisdom and correction. Simply, you know that you're doing something wrong and you stick with it. In the name of the Torah, you're called a fool. This is some of the things that the Rambam teaches and the other Alachot in chapter 2 go into the details that the Rambam says of how to fix different character traits where in so many words he says you have to go to the opposite extreme. If you are arrogant, then you have to bring shame to yourself. Live a lowly type of life. If you're angry, then you have to train yourself not to get angry because you have to build on your emuna and your bitachon and know that Hashem is the one that's running the world. And different things, you have to be go to the opposite extreme. But interestingly enough, the Rambam didn't base all of this on his own philosophical mind, but rather on a verse in the Torah coming from Isaiah. He mentioned what Isaiah said in chapter 5, verse 20, to remind you, Says, The prophet Isaiah says in the name of Akadosh Baruch Hu, Woe to the people who speak of evil as good and good as evil. Who make darkness into light and light into darkness they make bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter and then the following verse the rambam didn't mention but the prophet isaiah does says woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and in their own view understanding they decided that they know better than the rabbis. They decided they know better than Rav Wasserman. They decided they know better than the Poskim. They decided that they don't have to teach everything that the Lubavitcher Rebbe says. They decided they don't have to teach everything that the Baal Shem Tov says. They decided they don't have to teach everything that the Gemara says. Or everything that the Kadosh Baruch Hu says. Like when it says, Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat and Parashat Kitisa this week, they're going to skip that part. They're going to read it in the Kila when the guy goes up to the Torah, but the rabbi is not going to give you a lecture about that one how do i know i know and i don't even have to know where you are and the overwhelming majority of klal israel will not learn about Chilul shabbat this week why it's not such a popular teaching but in reality it's one of the most important parts of this week's parasha why every single one of us is related or is close to somebody that's a Michalel Shabbat. And if we all knew the magnitude of the punishment, of what will happen to those people if they stay that way, we'd cry ourselves to sleep every night until Hashem has mercy and opens up their heart to do tshuva. We'd lay in the streets in front of their cars and not allow them to drive. We tell them it's you want to drive kill me first why i can't bear the fact that you're going to kill yourself by kill by driving on shabbat why i'm not killing myself i'm just going to a club I'm just going to a pub I'm just going to the game I'm just going to work yeah you're killing yourself by doing that what do you mean i've been going to work for 30 40 years nothing happened to me shabbat now i know now i know shabbat now i know you're killing yourself by doing it why who said this week's pasha you drive on shabbat he's gonna kill you that's what it says that's what he says maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but for sure it's gonna happen why Hashem said it, it's gonna do it if that person rejects it means they're very very sick spiritually they're very sick spiritually but yet sometimes you'll see that very same sick person show up at the community events for Hanukkah for Purim He'll even show up to the shul on Shabbat after he drove. You'll show, you'll see him hugging the rabbi, and the rabbi says, Hey, Tzadik, how are you? Thanks for the support. We really appreciate that 25, 50, 100, 200,000 dollar donation you gave to our campaign for 87th building. 
Thanks a lot. You're a real tzaddik. You're going to see that guy. How come? How come you're going to see him? You're going to even see that guy. Say, Rabbi, so many problems in the world politically, so many problems in the world financially, so many problems in the world, anti-Semitism and so on. Mashiach now. And the rabbi says, Amen. Yeah, Mashiach now. And then he starts singing. Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the rest of the guys are coming. Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. And you get the whole song, eh? Where's the Torah say about those people? What does the Torah say about that nice song? It's a fantastic song. I sing it on Shabbat. But what does it really say about those people that are spiritually sick and singing Mashiach now? Says the prophet Amos, chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Hoi, amit avim et yom Adonai. Lama ze lachem yom Adonai. Uchoshech velo o. Woe to those who desire the day of Hashem. Why do you seek this day of Hashem? It is darkness and not light. The same Malbi Makadosh says on this Pasuk that day of Hashem is referring to the day of salvation when Mashiach comes. That's going to be a salvation, a sanctification of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Salvation for the tzaddikim, but not so for the reshaim, not so for those people. And therefore the pasuk says, Yom Choshech Velo'o, day that has darkness but no light. Why? Because the people that are saying Mashiach now, the prophet says, why are you saying Mashiach now? Mashiach comes going to kill you first. You're Mechalil Shabbat. You're wasting seed. You're a Mechalel Shem Hashem. You're an Apikor speaker. You're a heretic. You're this. You're what are you saying, Mashiach now? What are you saying, Mashiach now? What is to you and Mashiach now? What's to you in the day of Hashem? Day of Hashem is gonna kill you first. What are you talking about? What Mashiach now? You say Mashiach not now. Or do Chuva, whichever one. Do Chuva is a much better idea. But don't pretend like Mashiach is gonna be good for you. You're telling people that it's okay to drive on Shabbat. You're telling them that, that it's okay to do whatever they want, no matter what. Hashem loves the Mashiach now. Like as if Mashiach is a social security office, welfare, all combined into one. What Mashiach now? The prophet Amos says that's a day of darkness for you. person doesn't understand these things. Why? There's always some bearded fellow or some rabbits and kissing up to them. Always somebody kissing up to them. Rabotai Yekarim, the Chida in Sefer Ma'agal Tov says, from the day the Rabbanim needed the good, meaning the favor of the wealthy, the honor of the Torah was diminished. The day rabbis needed favors from rich people and started working for their favors, started talking to them based on their favors, started teaching them because of their favors, because of their donations, the honor of Torah was diminished. The second your speech to your congregation is affected in any way shape or form based on the donors that are in a crowd the torah has been diminished it is better off you don't speak otzara midrashim eisenstein page 204 section 16 says Translation, one must always run away from kissing up to people, meaning wicked people. You're kissing up to a tzaddik. You have Baba Sali in your, in your, in your life. You have a Rav Vigdor Miller, a Rav Yagen, a Rav Kanievsky, a Rav Ovadia. You're able to kiss their hand. Alvai, 
Alvai, kiss their feet if you can. Are you kissing up to the Shaim? Who's this referring to? It's referring to people that know that they're wicked. The rabbi knows that his business is dishonest. The rabbi knows that this guy is an adulterer. The rabbi knows that this woman is immodest. He has eyes. The rabbi knows that these people are violating Shabbat. He knows. But he kisses up to them anyway. Why? They're big donors. So the Otsara Midrashim says on such a person, one must always run away from kissing up to wicked people because it's equated to idolatry, immorality, and murder all into one. Idolatry, immorality, and murder are all considered the same as kissing up to people. Now you probably heard that combination once before or maybe twice or three times or actually every year where did you hear that idolatry immorality and murder are combined i'll remind you every tisha b'av you've heard it in fact many times during history you've heard it why those three reasons are the reasons why are famously known as the reasons why Kadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the first holy Bet HaMikdash, which was much holier than the second Bet HaMikdash. Why did he destroy it? These three sins. These three sins are Botaya Karim. Idolatry, morality, and murder. Meaning that it wasn't necessarily that everybody started worshipping some Buddha or some uh, Yoshke. It wasn't everybody that was committing adultery and cheating on their wives and husbands. It wasn't everybody that was killing people in the streets. No. And even if it was the entire community, why? Why did he kill the rabbis that said he came? The ones that were learning to lie, he killed millions of them. How come? Because our Midrash teaches us. The Gemara, Masechet Shabbat says they didn't rebuke. What does it mean they didn't rebuke? So what did they do? They were too busy kissing up to them. And therefore they were judged as if they themselves were idol worshippers, immoral, and murderers. That's what happened. And that's what's happening. Anyone that's kissing up to his community, changing their speech, or not saying 100% of what the Torah says, is committing all three of those crimes. And not only doing a disservice to their community, but is openly practicing idolatry, openly practicing immorality, openly murdering the people. And such a person, and such a person, Rabotai Karim. Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, has four different curses set on such a person. One of them in chapter 27, verse 26, Parashat Kitavo. Aru asher lo yakim et devar Torah azot la'asot otam ve'omar kol ha'am, amen. Cursed is the one who will not uphold the words of this Torah to perform them. And the entire people shall say amen. What does it mean, cursed is the person who will not uphold these, this Torah? You know the Torah says one thing and you do another. That's one way. You know somebody else is teaching Torah Emet, but you teach them not to listen to him. Nah, he's too extreme for this generation. Nah, you know, he made a mistake here and there. Nah, he did this, he did that. Yeah, but he teaches Emet. He helps people do tshuva. He says the truth. The mistakes were honest mistakes. Why are you telling people not to listen to him? Why? Ah, you know, it's not... eh, eh, eh. Ah, you are rule. And you know what happens to such people? It says such a person is cursed. What does it mean such a person is cursed? What, 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 actually, what actually happens? In the times of Moshe Rabbeinu, six 
of the tribes were on Mount Eval. Six of the tribes were on Mount Grizi. The Aaron HaKodesh and the Kohanim and the Levim, the elders of the Levim, were all in the valley in between those two mountains, saying, Blessed is such a person that does this, this, and this. And all of the nation would say, Amen. Blessed is a person that does this, 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 and this. And all of the nation would say, Amen. But then they would get to the curses. Cursed is a person that does these things and all of the nation says, Amen. Now we already know that every verse in the Torah is applicable today. Which means that when a person goes against the Holy Torah in Shemaim, you have Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David, Shlomo, Moshe, Aaron, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Meir Baranes, all of the tzaddikim on such a person are saying, Arur, Asher lo yakim et divrei ha-Torah azot, la-asot otam. Vomar kol ha-am amen. Cursed is such a person. Cursed is such a person who will not uphold the words of the Torah. And the entire people shall say amen. Who are these people? All of the tzedekim in all of the generations. All of the prophets throughout all of the generation are saying amen to curse that person. They just distorted the Torah willingly openly publicly and told a young girl or told a young boy or told an old man or an older woman something that's contrary to what the torah says that's the first arul. the second arul comes the verse before it which says arul shochad laakot nefesh dam naki Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to kill a person of innocent blood. That rabbi takes the donation of those people, takes the bribe while he commits murder, while he tells them falsehood. And all of the tzaddikim and shemaim say that person is cursed. And Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Pinchas, all of the tzaddikim say Amen. He's Aru. He's cursed. Whoa, what a tshuva is going to have to do to get out of that hole. What a tshuva is going to have to do to get out of that hole or else he's going to get the genome of all genomes. But that's only the second Aru. Before that it says in the previous verse, Aru makereo basetel v'amar kol Amen. Cursed is the one who strikes his fellow stealthily in hiding. The entire people shall say amen. What does it mean to hit your fellow in hiding? You're telling your congregation falsehood of the Torah. And they don't know. They don't know any better. They rely on you. They rely on you to tell them the truth. They don't even know what the truth is. They rely on you. Why? Because they're too busy on Wall Street. They're too busy on Main Street. They're too busy selling stuff, buying stuff, doing stuff. You're the scholar. They're relying on you. And you tell them falsehood. You rasha merusha. Torah says, Aru, cursed is such a person. Cursed is such a person. And that's only the third curse. That's only the third curse. The fourth one comes several verses beforehand. Verse 18. Amen. Cursed is the one who causes the blind to go astray on the road. And the entire people shall say Amen. Sometimes you'll have a person that starts to do tshuva. He wants to start keeping Shabbat. He wants to start protecting his breed. He wants to start doing good things. And sometimes you'll have some Rasha Merusha that calls himself a rabbi. Say, nah, you're being too fanatic. You're being too fanatic. You're doing too much. 
Go have a good time. Have a good time. What do you mean have a good time? Come to our community. Yeah, but your community is far from my house. I can't. I can't walk here. I would have to drive. Okay, so drive here, no? What do you mean? I can drive to Shul on Shabbat. Listen, you're doing the mitzvah. At least you picked to, to drive to Shul. What a tzaddik you are. You could have driven anywhere else. Yeah, but shouldn't I just stay in my community? Where I am? Nah, that Shul is not like, it's not like here. All your friends are here. All your friends are here. I'm here. Well, money's here. You know, a bank's here. We're a bank. We keep your... Somebody tries to do tshuva and somebody tells them, no, no. Don't go to Shul to well. Come, have a drink with us. Come, have some fun with us. Come, watch the game with us. Come, do this with us, that with us. He doesn't even know what's the right and wrong. Why? He's depending on you, Mr. Rabbi Weinberg, Mr. Menace, Mr. Droll, Prager, and the rest of the clowns out there destroying Am Yisrael. He's depending on you. And what do you do? You mislead the blind who don't even know what's right and wrong yet. And therefore, the Torah says, you're all arurim. You're all cursed. In the name of the Torah. Now, you may not think it's a big deal, but as soon as Hashem fulfills the Amen of Avram, the Amen of Yitzchak, the Amen of Yaakov, the Amen of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Amen of Aaron Akoen, the Amen of David the Melech, the Amen of Shlomo Melech, the Amen of the Rambam, the Amen of Rabbi Akiva, the Amen of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and all of the Tzadikim of the Gemara, all of the Rishonim, all of the Achronim, all of the major real Hasidim throughout all of history, including the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Baal Tanya, all of the ones in between, the Magid Mezrich, the Baal Shem Tov, he fulfills their amends. The amount of damage that will happen upon your heads will be more severe than you can possibly fathom because of the damage that you caused people. How's that for fire and brimstone? You see, Rabotei Karim. When a person knows how much damage will happen to a loved one if they continue doing what they're doing, he has to scream, he has to cry, he has to act even in ways he doesn't want to be. Why? He knows that if he doesn't, the damage is unrepairable. The damage is unmeasurable and because he can't fathom to see his brother his sister his fellow go to the inevitable doom that their false speakers leaders and rabbis and politicians are leading them he has to do whatever he can even if it makes him less popular less wealthy less whatever you want to say and more anxiety more headache more people say nasty things more of all the things that everybody else is afraid of he says well you know what as uncomfortable as the hate mail and the blackmail and the this mail and the that mail is it's still a good idea why those are Hashem's kids and we have to do it let that be our lesson from what Rav Wasserman is saying here there are many that are going to try to tell you that the way of Torah is a way of comfort and comforting speech and although there are many beautiful stories in the Torah, although there are countless beautiful stories of tzaddikim, anyone who reads the full work of the Torah and what it means, the full work of the prophets and what they mean, the full work of the Gemara 
And what it means? The full work of the Zohar Kadosh, the full work of the Rishonim, the Rambam, the Ramban, the Rosh, the Achonim, the full work of the magnitude of their words. Regardless of whether they're coming from Hasidut Chabad, Hasidut Breslev, Bobov, Tzans, anything, you will always arrive at the conclusion. Torah is an instruction set. But that instruction set could also be called a book of punishments, a book of war. Why? It's full of it. It's full of rebuke. It's full of punishments for those who choose to remain morally sick. We all have a choice, Rabotai. We all have a choice and our Chachamim have clarified that choice. You can choose the way of the Torah. And although that may seem more difficult to you than imaginable, I promise you that's only an illusion because you only think it's difficult because currently you're sick. The more medicine you take, the more you're going to see that it's actually not difficult at all. And in fact, it is the medicine. On the other hand, going a different route. Going in a route where you only want to hear things that complement your current behavior. Complement your misbehavior. Support your immorality. Support your adultery. Put a blind, blind eye to your lies. Put a blind eye to your misbehaviors. Thinking that that's a better way. We all know how that's going to end. And in case you don't, rewind to the beginning of the shiul. And Benzat Hashem will succeed better the next time. In teaching you what you were supposed to already learn in the last two hours. After the war of all wars. And all of these heretics in Apikosi will be destroyed from the world. The Pasuk in Zechariah says, You know when you have a dream and you see a pretty woman? You've had that? Now you never actually see an ugly woman in dreams. It's always a pretty woman. And by the way, it's always the same woman for all of us. have a dream of the same exact woman. And she's more dangerous than the Satan himself. You're not even allowed to say her name. What are you going to call her for? It functions very much like drugs. People are addicted to it. I tried to quit dozens of times, hundreds of times. My fantasies and stuff, they're not mine anymore. Can't 
cabinet ministers, judges, diplomats, even one of the country's top spies. These men are accused of some of the most sadistic child sexual abuse imaginable on hundreds of victims. It shouldn't take over your whole life. If you satiate it, you're never going to have enough. If you starve it and only feed it when it's permissible, according to the Torah, you're always going to be happy.